Software and Security Engineering, Lecture 9, Segment 5. The syst system safety isn't just a matter of the hardware, the software, and the people who operate it. It's also a matter of the surrounding institutions and the cultural assumptions and expectations which um, help to drive how people develop systems and how people operate them. And so for that reason, when we consider things like the civil aviation system or the uh, system of intensive care in hospitals, or for that matter, um, the uh, world's um, card payment networks, we think of them as complex socio-technical systems. Let's look here at the system of civil aviation, which is a relatively simple one for a number of reasons. The first is that it's been running since just after the end of World War I, and in its modern form since uh, the end of World War II. As a result, it's got stable components. Um, aircraft design hasn't changed all that much since the late 1940s. Uh, neither has the design of avionics. We use basically the same kit, although um, it's modern and digital, uh, rather than old-fashioned and electromechanical. Pilot training is much the same as it was um, in, in the 1940s or 1950s. Flying on instruments is still the same skill, and air traffic control works in the same way. As a result, you've got stable interfaces, and in particular, um, we understand crew capabilities, and we also understand the capabilities of uh, maintenance staff and air traffic controllers and other key stakeholders. What's really critical is that there are better incentives for learning than with medical devices. Um, if your infusion pump fails when you're in critical care and you die, well, you were sick enough to be in critical care, so you might well have died anyway. And so if there was a mistake, it may not be investigated very much. Um, and since the deaths occur um, one at a time, distributed all over the world, there's never the political um, will to do something. Um, air crashes are different. Uh, because then lots of people die at once, it's front page news, um, it harms the airlines financially, it harms the aircraft vendors financially. And so that's one of the reasons uh, why your risk of dying if you get on a um, scheduled airline flight is only about 1 in 12 million. But institutional failures can still happen, just as with the London Ambulance Service. And so in this segment I'm going to discuss the Boeing 737 MAX. This has been, without doubt, the world's biggest software failure yet in terms of lost lives and economic damage. There were two crashes five months apart, the first one by Wizz Air in Indonesia in 2018, and then later in Ethiopia in 2019, which between, between them killed 346 people, everyone who was on board the two aircraft that came down. As a result, the fleet of Boeing 737 MAX aircraft was grounded, which affected operations of a number of um, airlines, and, and then production was halted when it became clear that there wasn't going to be some easy software fix that would enable them to get airborne again. By March 2020, the last time for which we have got um, reasonably believable numbers, Boeing had lost almost $19 billion in lost sales and in compensation that it paid to airlines who either um, lost service or had to lease aircraft from elsewhere. Boeing's market cap was down $60 billion. And this is um, not only the worst thing that ever happened in our trade, um, it's also interesting because Boeing and the Federal Aviation Authority made a whole lot of the mistakes that we've seen already, and then some. First of all, the Boeing 737 is the workhorse of the world's airlines, a short to medium range single aisle plane that carries a bit over 100 people, and it had been in service for 60 years going through five successive variants. Now, the reason that they kept the same model was the same uh, reason as we saw the uh, two different types of the same model of infusion pump earlier in the course. It saves the cost of certification and it saves the cost of pilot retraining. Now, the, the latter is obviously sensible. Uh, the former is uh, perhaps a bug rather than a feature, as we will see. So the reason that Boeing brought in its newest generation of 737 is that Airbus had brought in a competitor, um, which was more fuel efficient. And since fuel is one of the biggest operating costs of the airlines, uh, they were starting to go to Airbus, so Boeing was under intense competitive pressure. Uh, to put on more fuel efficient engines. And this meant engines that were physically bigger, that had a, a bigger bypass ratio, a bigger fan at the front, 
to draw cold air around the hot air expelled from the jet engine's core. This increases fuel efficiency and also cuts noise. However, the um, Boeing's undercarriage wasn't as long as the Airbus's, and so they ended up having to move the engines forward in order to make them fit. And once they got the aircraft into its uh, test flight program, the pilots discovered that they couldn't easily trim the plane at high speed. You see, when you fly an aircraft, um, you've got the joystick in front of you, which you can pull forward um, to cause the nose to go up and push down to make the, the nose to go down. And this activates the stabilizer and the horizontal control surface in the tail. And you don't want to be having to continually apply pressure. And so there's a little trim wheel that you can use uh, to um, zero out this pressure. And the trim wheel, as you'll see on the video, um, in the Boeing 737 could require as much as 40 or 50 kilograms of force to trim the aircraft um, if it was maneuvering at high speed. And so the fix that, software, that, that, that Boeing went for was called the Maneuvering Characteristics Augmentation System, or MCAS. This was software that was added to an existing flight control computer. There was a fatal design error though. The flight control computer got input from two angle of attack sensors. These sensors measure um, the uh, extent to which the nose of the aircraft is pitched up or down relative to the oncoming airstream. However, the MCAS software used only one of them, and this was really, really dumb because angle of attack sensors are regularly damaged. Bird strikes, ground crew uh, um, knocking the sensor with a, uh, a staircase, all sorts of things go wrong. And so what happened in both of the fatal crashes is that the single angle of attack sensor failed, and then there was an uncommanded nose down trim. In other words, the trim put the aircraft's nose down um, far too much, um, resulting in the pilot having to pull either on the yoke or on the trim wheel with a huge amount of force, 40 or 50 kilograms, that's the weight of a small person, in order to keep the nose up. In the case of the um, Indonesian flight, they managed that for a while and eventually lost. In the case of the Ethiopian flight, they lost it shortly after takeoff. Now, this uncommanded nose down trim happened um, when a certain combination of circumstances occurred, uh, particularly when the pilot used electric trim. If he used manual trim, it was okay. And as you'll see from the uh, video to which I've linked, the logic around this was slightly flaky, like Therag. But of course, once you had two crashes, people looked at it and they figured out what was going on. There were aggravated, aggravating factors. Boeing did a safety analysis of the kind that we've dis described earlier in this course, and they wrote down all the things that could go wrong, um, as you would um, do in a failure modes and effects analysis. And unintended MCAS activation was rated major, um, which in the aircraft industry scheme of things, means maybe somebody gets injured. In other words, if the, if the plane wobbles around a bit and the food cart slides around the, um, the cabin, that, that's a major thing. Rather than catastrophic, a catastrophic um, failure is one where everybody gets killed. And as a result, the failure modes and effects analysis wasn't continued and carried out thoroughly on the MCAS software itself. In fact, um, in order to um, minimize the amount of retraining that pilots would need when moving from existing 737s to the 737 MAX, uh, Boeing lobbied the FAA to allow them to remove MCAS from the pilot manual. Curiously, Boeing in its assessments also failed to anticipate cockpit chaos, and we discussed this in, uh, in, in the last segment. This is one of the reasons why uh, people, including Boeing, had worked very, very hard to rationalize cockpit layout but when it came to considering this particular failure mode, um, they were blind to that. There was also an institutional factor in that about 10 years previously, um, Boeing had moved its headquarters from Seattle, which it had been um, since Bill Boeing founded the company about 100 years ago, to Chicago. And that had coincided with the company management being taken over by accountants and bankers, while previously it had been an engineer-heavy company where the top management um, were always engineers and often engineers who had also been pilots. And this led to a change in culture, which was exacerbated by other institutional factors. Now, Boeing is, in essence, a monopoly 
um, within the USA because they've been allowed to take over the previous competitor, McDonnell Douglas, and have managed to marginalize a number of the smaller aircraft makers overseas. Its only real competitor um, is um, Airbus in the European Union. And as a result, they've come to be seen as an American national champion, and the regulator, the FAA, had become kind of subservient to them. Now, one of the ways that this expressed itself is that Boeing took over uh, much of the safety assurance from the FAA's own staff, and the manager in charge of this, although located in Boeing's facilities in Seattle, uh, was no longer uh, reporting to the FAA, but to, to Boeing management. The um, Boeing-FAA relationship um, had exposed itself um, 10 years previously. There had been a slightly similar accident in 2009 with the previous model of 737, when an unrelated failure of the flight control system um, caused the Turkish Airlines 737NG to land short of the runway at Schiphol, um, killing the flight crew, um, one uh, cabin attendant and five passengers. Uh, the other 130 passengers survived. And in the inquiry into that, Boeing managed to get Uncle Sam to arm twist the Dutch investigators into not looking too closely at the software. And um, instead, they managed to represent this as being pilot error. And Boeing initially hoped that the Indonesia crash was pilot error because the airline in question had had some previous accidents and incidents. The FAA, for its part, realized by then that there was a problem with the software, but decided to let the US fleet continue flying because after all, Boeing was a national champion. And the last thing you want to do is to be unpatriotic, uh, especially if you're a Washington agency in the um, days of the Donald Trump administration. And such arrangements are surprisingly common. They're called regulatory capture. It happens in one industry after another that the regulator, the government body that's supposed to set and enforce safety standards, ends up being captured by the industry that it regulates. And there are many reasons for this. Regulators uh, tend to be civil servants and lawyers. They don't have the engineering expertise um, to regulate an airline, nor do they have the expertise in banking and cryptography to regulate payment networks, nor do they have the expertise in drugs and medical devices uh, to, to regulate medical device makers and pharmaceutical companies. And so in one field after another, we find that although, in theory, regulation should be able to impose safety, in practice it's hard. It tends to work a little bit better in the European Union than it does at the national level, because the European Union, being transnational, is less uh, prone to being bullied by national politicians. But even there, institutional factors do make a difference. <laughs>